Now you might come to this video thinking that the most important skill in game art is about being able to make stuff like this. Beautiful environments, or just straight up cool art. But I want you to take a moment and look at this. Or this. And perhaps even this. It's easier than you think to make a scene where it's difficult to see what's going on. So we're going to talk a bit about readability. So what is it? If I give you this scene, and ask you where all the colliders are, you'd probably, without even having played the game, be able to draw each and every collider and hitbox. However, if I give you a scene like this, you might not only draw colliders that aren't there, so you might mistake this for a collider, even though it's just part of the background, but on top of that you would also most likely miss colliders that are there, like this one, which is hidden behind this pillar. So in its simplest form, readability is kind of about being able to convey the important stuff in your game to the player. And the reason why I dislike poor readability so much is that if I cannot see the important stuff in your game, if the game can't actually communicate what's going on, I'm going to take damage and I'm going to die. It sucks and it isn't fun. It turns people away from your game. But since this is really about being able to communicate really well, it also means that if we want our game to be as readable as possible, our game would be made of hitboxes and nothing else. It's readable, but ugly. So generally we need to balance readability with the aesthetics. And how we balance it will depend on our taste. So you get games like Dead Cells, where it can on occasion be difficult to make sense of what's going on. But that can also make it extremely satisfying to play, because of how responsive and chaotic it feels. And on the other end, you have games like Hue, which is extremely readable, but it can feel a bit too simple, and a bit less engaging. Perfect for a puzzle platformer, but perhaps not as nice as an action platformer. Which is why you also get games like Umbrella, which has a green shader and screen shake making the game more engaging at the cost of readability. But the game actually allows you to toggle this off, giving you the option to make it more readable if you would want to. But regardless of where on this scale you land, I just want you to understand the importance of readability and gameplay, and avoid accidentally making scenes like this. So let's create a scene that is kind of similar to this, and step by step make it more readable. But we're going to start here. I might argue that the reason this is bad is because of poor drawing skills. But this isn't about drawing skills. It's about making it clear to the player what's going on by just being mindful of where we place our contrast. This arc here is invisible. This character barely stands out. These platforms, while there, aren't particularly distinct. And that is in part because this scene has pretty low contrast all over. The saturation is low and the scene is fairly consistently grey. If we look at Salt and Sanctuary, this is most likely done using post-processing effects. Because the scene is so consistently grey and unsaturated, Almost as if you've taken your entire canvas and just reduced the brightness, contrast, and saturation. And that's actually what I did. So if we were to just remove the post-processing effects we can see here, you can see that the character starts to stand out. Now the character is fairly vibrant and colorful, next to the grey background. This is why I've mentioned in the past how I like the fact that the character in Hollow Knight has a white head. Because the white and black head will always stand out in almost any scene and keeping track of where you are is pretty important when playing a game. If we just make the important stuff have higher contrast, then that stuff will be noticed more easily, and it will be easier to play our game. And in our case, now the character stands out, but the background itself is still fairly messy and cluttered. But with a little bit of contrast, we can fix this. First and foremost, we can add particle effects behind the arc, and now the arc actually becomes visible. If we want, we could also add a slight tint to our entire background, making it be slightly more washed out. This makes our platforming area have higher contrast, so it stands out more. So we can actually get our scene significantly more readable without ever redrawing our assets. But we don't even need to add this tint. If we just take all our platforms and reduce the contrast in the middle of the asset, and then add contrast to the edges, the platforms will stand out more, and make our scene less cluttered and more readable. This is generally an easy mistake to make. We add stuff to make our scene look good, but if we add a lot of random stuff and strong textures in our scene, the scene becomes cluttered. You can solve this by using blur shaders if you want, but we could also just reduce the amount of assets and particle effects we have in our scene. Less stuff, fewer things that demand our attention. Because as I've mentioned in the past, you probably want to avoid clutter scenes like this one. It looks kind of cool, but it's a mess to play. But how come I sit here and complain about contrast and clutter, and then you have games like Candle, which is fairly cluttered, but still feels fairly readable? Well, because this initial explanation of readability is simplified. If I say something like, high contrast demands attention, that is generally true. This scene is slightly more annoying to look at because the background has really high contrast compared to the foreground. But that isn't the only thing that is happening. What humans are good at are pattern matching. 
So if I give you a fairly muted and gray scene, and then add a box with a high contrast, your attention will be drawn to it. Now I could say that the reason your attention is drawn to it is because of the contrast. But suppose I give you a scene like this one, and then I add a single gray box. Now your attention is drawn to the gray box. All your brain is doing is looking at what's on the screen and then grouping each thing according to a pattern they share. If you make the platforming elements have a high contrast, and then add one or two background elements with high contrast, your brain will try and group these elements together. You might assume that the background elements have colliders, even though they don't. Or you might get the opposite situation, where these houses barely have any separation in the contrast, so you assume that there aren't any colliders, even though there are. Your job as an artist should be to help make this pattern recognition easier. And to give you a good example of this, we can continue looking at Gumbrella. Look at this scene. Think about where your attention goes. You see the blue bed in the corner. It's basically the only saturated bright blue in the scene, so it stands out. You see the blinking bottles, and you see these rats running around. And in the case of this scene, the blue bed is the safe spot, so it's important. The blinking bottles are stuff that you can interact with, so it's also important. And while this chest is more important than the rats running around, you can clearly see that they've put thought into this scene. Every pattern we can see is also a pattern that we will try and organize the scene by. So if you want to make a platform more readable, you can just add a pattern to all platforms. This is kind of what Madshot does here even though the game is extremely readable to begin with. And so the reason a game like Candle can be fairly cluttered but still read well is because of two things. The background is separated from the foreground using contrast separation, and each and every asset in the scene clearly communicates what it is. This is a platform, this is a hole, this is a ladder, this is an enemy. You don't have to struggle to parse the scene. This is basically the most stereotypical ladder you could think of, less confusion, more readable. And as I mentioned, it's generally fine if you add a lot of clutter, as long as you keep that clutter consistent. Look at Ghost Song, extremely cluttered, but the separation between the background and the platforming area is done well, so it reads well and looks good. We can even look at a game like Doomblade, which I think generally borders on feeling too cluttered and kind of annoying to look at. But it actually reads well enough to be playable, because the edges of every single platform is highlighted. It doesn't matter too much if this stuff is messy, I can still see what's going on and where I need to go. If we jump back to this example with the high contrast box, and we pay attention to what's happening in our head, it's not only that we're grouping the background to be one thing and the box to be a separate thing, but we are also paying extra attention to the box. If we now increase the contrast on our character as well, now we're grouping the character and the box together and we pay attention to both of them. So generally we do pay attention to stuff that is in focus, stuff that is high contrast. That's kind of how our brain parses the world. But I also want to point out that while we do look for patterns, we're also fairly good at tuning things out once we have kind of understood them and concluded that they aren't important. Which is why I generally don't mind grain shaders or particle effects such as rain. It's there, but it's also so predictable that it's easy to tune out when you're actually playing. But what can happen for a beginner artist is that they add a lot of these type of odd things that don't get mentally grouped in with the background. And now our attention jumps from this to this to this to this. It's too many things that demand our attention and it becomes annoying to look at. So it's not clutter in the traditional sense. It's not really about having too many things. It's that you can't ignore assets that don't create a uniform pattern. So your attention just jumps from one thing to the other. There's no clear hierarchy of attention. When we create our scene, we need to be mindful of what we want the player to pay attention to, and what we want them to ignore. And so understanding readability and understanding what your art communicates can also make your art look better. Being able to see the patterns you're creating is essentially a large part of what composition and style is about. When you start looking at the scene as a whole and understanding that the background elements need to feel as they belong together, you not only improve readability, but your scene also starts looking better. And this is actually the biggest problem with this scene still. This is an arc, but if you want to have a rock arc, I really should accentuate that idea. If this is a rock platform, add some rock blocks. And since we want our platforms to stand out more, maybe we make it a wood platform instead. And if you want to add stuff to our scene, you should think of things that the player will think belong. That way they will tune it out when they're actually playing. So a bookcase like this is frankly an odd asset to make in a scene like this. We should get rid of this bookcase, quite frankly. It doesn't make sense, and it uses colors that make it stand out, breaking the immersion of the scene. And at this point, you might be arguing that I just took this kind of bad scene and made it in my style. But you can also take this scene, add some grittiness, add some textures, add a green shader, and get something that looks a bit more dark and less like my style. 
We can add detail and textures as long as we still make sure that the important stuff stands out. We can even add some clutter. As long as it makes sense for our scene, it just makes the scene look a bit nicer. So we have done a lot of stuff to our scene, but there's still one thing we haven't done. It kind of looks like we can make out all the important information in our scene. It kind of looks readable, and it looks like we can see everything. But if we think back to the important information in our game, the collision boxes, we don't actually know where they are. They're somewhere here, but where exactly? Since we're seeing this scene from quite a bit above, we don't actually know. This is why I generally think you should avoid this type of view when making platforming heavy games. It's generally fine for action platformers since you don't really need to jump that much. And it's also fine for puzzle platformers like Candle since you can take your time. But there's a risk when hiding your collisions like this that the player will miss a jump or two. Or like here in Candle, I actually literally missed that I could jump to this platform. It looked like a wall to me. This generally wouldn't happen if you shift your view down a bit, or even better, make your camera completely orthogonal to the scene. And we can see that this actually does make a significant difference. And if our player needs to do a lot of these really precise jumps, it's probably better to match the collisions almost perfectly, instead of hiding it like this. And just a note, this view does look wrong. So does this, but even this view is actually incorrect. We can't really make a realistic 2D view without adding actual 3D. But that is a topic for another video. So is this it? Well, not really. So far, we have looked at our scene while standing still, but games aren't static. And if we look back to this scene, we actually pay quite a bit of attention to the rats running back and forth. We can tune things out that we find unimportant, but when things move, we tend to always pay extra attention to it because it's constantly feeding us new information that we need to process. So we really need to pay attention to if our scene changes. A game with a static camera can generally get away with a messier scene if it would want to. But if our scene changes and our camera does move, we need to understand the effect that has on the player's attention. And not only because you might have assets that obscure the gameplay, but you also get scenarios like this one. If we look at this boss in Gumbrella, which was mechanically an easy boss, the only reason it might possibly feel difficult is because of the strong spin shake and the regular flashes, making it harder to focus. Personally, I don't like adding difficulty in this kind of way, but to each their own. So you might think that a lot of this is kind of nitpicky. When I made my video on Eternal Noctis and critique the readability, I got a few comments mentioning how I just need to get better. And this is in part true, but not in the way you think. You see, you can have games that have fairly poor readability. If you show a team fight of Dota 2 to someone who's unfamiliar to the game, they'll most likely think it's too chaotic and annoying to look at. But if you showed the same team fight to me, I would quite easily separate each and every element and I could follow what's going on. Why? Well, the patterns might be many and they might be confusing. But if you've seen them a thousand times, after a while, you will understand them. That is not to say that readability can't affect Dota players. So if these type of issues can affect professional players and definitely do affect players that have played for a really long time, it will most likely also affect the people playing whatever game you're making. The difference is that the people playing your game might not have the patience to get good. They might not have the patience to sink a thousand hours into making sense of your scene. So it's generally in your best interest to make the patterns easy to digest at first glance. Thanks for watching. Bye.